scores table, picks up the electronic computer and smashes it to the floor. He goes over there and slaps his own son around, kicks a couple of the cheerleaders as he's walking off the court, and then he goes and he picks up the ball rack and he throws it at the fans. What's up with that? Well, in the second half, Bob Knight, the general, the Hall of Famer, the bully, the one who promotes fear and intimidation and exclusiveness and the plutocracy. Here was Bob Knight changing everything around. And this guy that played for Florida State in the first half as the greatest player ever, now he becomes the biggest dog you've ever seen. And he starts playing like Benoit Benjamin or Sean Bradley. Pick your favorite stiff, Eric Dampier, it doesn't matter, they're all interchangeable. And as the game is winding to a close and Indiana is completely turned around, they're moving on in the tournament and Florida State and this guy, they're slinking off the court. The sports information director for Florida State, the guy whose job it is to come and give the television broadcasters all the information, he comes up and whispers in my ear. He says, Bill, the guy who didn't have a good second half, the reason is, is because he's got an upset stomach. <laughs> okay, no problem. So I file that away. and Just as we're saying goodbye and sending it back to... Jim Nance and Clark Kellogg in the studios in New York for CBS, this lightning bolt flash of inspiration just sears across the smoking crater that is my mind. And here I was knowing what to say because I took my last breath and my partner's leaning into his microphone to say goodbye and would be joining the stu studio crew in New York. I leaned in and I put my hand over his microphone and I got right in the face of my microphone as close as I could and I said, hey, this is the NCAA tournament. You're playing against Bob Knight and Indiana University. You got one chance in your life to do something. If that's me and my teammates got an upset stomach, I'm taking that guy downstairs in the locker room. I'm putting a finger down his throat, going to have him puke it back up and let's get going. We got a game. Who wants to play ball today? Well. My partner looks at me as like, oh my gosh. Well, in the world of broadcasting, like any other business, we all have bosses. In television, on our desk, we have a, a telephone. You can't have a ringer on it because you can't have any extraneous noise. You have to have lights all around it. And as soon as I started talking about puking it up, and taking the guy downstairs and putting a finger down his throat, this telephone just lights up. Now we're in commercial break and I realize that it's for me. So I pick up the phone and the guy says to me, hey Walton, my name is Neil Pilsen and I'm the president of CBS Sports. And if you look at your watch right now, you'll notice that it's the dinner hour in New York City. And we at CBS Sports never talk about puking during New York City's dinner hour. But to show you how much things have changed, we talk about growth, we talk about progress. Now, television executives, they would just assume the broadcasters puke themselves as you come on the air, just to get that spike in the ratings, that extra time spent viewing by you, our loyal listeners. But when I think about what Compere is doing, when I think about the choices that you folks have made to come here today, the choice that we all make to be a part of something special. I think of the choice that I made so many years ago when I was a high school player now in San Diego playing for Helix High School and all the coaches from around this country, they were coming to recruit me and they made me every promise in the world. Bill, you come to our school, we're gonna make you the greatest player in the history of our program. You'll own every statistical record by the time you leave here. And by the way, Billy, Mr. and Mrs. Walton, here's the three C's of college basketball, some cash, Condo, car keys, jewelry, clothes, what do you want? Your parents want new jobs? And by the way, Billy, here's the cheerleader's phone number. She's our closer out there. And just let your imagination run wild. And, and I used to think that I had a vivid imagination, but that was before I met Dennis Rodman and Marv Albert. And they changed the entire spectrum of what was going on out there. And now as a young 16-year-old high school student, there I was when Coach Wooden walked into my home in San Diego. And he sat down and said, Billy, Mr. and Mrs. Walton, I know what all the other schools are promising you. We at UCLA, we don't work like that. In fact, Billy, if you come to UCLA, I can't even promise you that you're gonna make our team. And I looked at him, I said, you're a nut. What are you talking about? Everybody else is telling me I'm gonna be the next great player in the history of basketball, and you're telling me I'm not gonna make your team? My parents, confused as could be, because I desperately wanted to go to college as they wanted me to, but we couldn't afford for me to go to a, a, a school, even a public university like UCLA. And so, Coach Wooden looked at us and said, Billy, Mr. and Mrs. Walton, at UCLA, 
under my supervision, we require that you develop and progress as a human being and become a contributing member of the society at large. We also require and demand that you excel in the classroom. And once you cross those two barriers, then we give you a practice jersey and we give you a chance to try out for our team. <laughs> I'm looking at it, my parents are just eating this stuff up. It's unbelievable. And I look at him, I said, you're crazy, silly old man. What are you talking about? He says, okay, Billy, I'll make you one promise. Because I've seen you play, and I know you're a spirited individual that likes to get out there and mix it up, just the kind of player we like at UCLA. And so what he said was, I'll make you the promise that if you come to UCLA, and if you pass those two barriers and criteria, and you make our team, I promise you, Billy, that the guys next to you, your teammates, they'll be not only outstanding human beings, but first-rate basketball players as well. Because, Billy, you have to learn at the earliest of ages that your success is not based so much on what you do. Anybody can make their own numbers. Anybody can get their job done. But how good are the guys around you? How good are those teammates? And so I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to be part of something special. And I made that choice and I went up to UCLA. And when I went up there, I was so ecstatic. This was 1970 and I couldn't wait to get out of my parents' house. They were the strictest people I ever saw. The rules, the regulations, the obligations, the duties, the responsibilities. I mean, this was 1970. This was Vietnam. This was Nixon. This was the beginning of Watergate. This was rock and roll with the Stones and the Beatles and Dylan and Carlos Santana and Neil Young and Crosby, Stills and Nash and Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead and I'm on my way to UCLA and I'm free, free, free at last. What could be better? Little did I realize that there standing on the steps of UCLA was Johnny Wooden saying, young man, come right on in here. You're mine for the next four years. I thought my parents were strict. This guy was off the charts. And that very first day at UCLA, we're out there on the court warming up, ready to carry on the legacy, on their tradition to make it all happen. And Coach Wooden comes walking out. And here he was. You folks know him as the church parson, the calm guy with his little rolled up program all dressed up in his nice fancy suits. Coach Wooden, we knew him as the cage tiger, as the first great basketball player ever. This guy, when they had the inaugural year of the Basketball Hall of Fame just down the expressway here in Springfield, Massachusetts, Coach Wooden, as a player, was the first person ever inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame, 1959. And he would come walking out to practice every day with those glasses, he couldn't see a thing. He had his bent over bad leg dragging it out there all the time. And he was dressed in his basketball uniform. He was 65 years old, it was the funniest thing you ever saw. His short shorts and his tight little jersey and everything. Who is this guy? And he comes walking out, squinting through those glasses, making sure everything is fine. Like the championship banner has gotten at at the expense of Pat, Pat Alavetto and the St. Bonaventure Bonnies. 64, 65, the Alcindor years of 67, 68, 69, the Sidney Wicks, Curtis Rowe, Steve Patterson, Henry Bibby and John Vanley years 70 and 71, and now it's our turn in 72. And Coach Wooden walks out there and knowing that everything's in place says, you new guys come with me. I got something to say, I got something to tell you. If we said, yeah, he's gonna give us the key. He's gonna give us a pill, he's gonna give us a speech, it's gonna make us really great. So we followed him so loyally, so faithfully into that locker room. We sat down in our stools in the locker room and coach comes in and sits down and he says, man, we're like sponges. Please coach, we want so bad to be great. Tell us what it takes. And he says, this is how you put your shoes and socks on. And we looked at each other